Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 121. In this episode, I interview David Sandelman. He is the owner of Canatrol and is the inventor of the Canatrol Cool Cure. He talks all about drying and curing plants in this episode and answers several questions that relate to the cool cure. If you want to see highlights of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That channel is dedicated to short, bite-sized clips of these episodes. I also have a gardening channel where I have over 130 videos showing the plants that I've grown in my garden. I'll have that channel linked down in the YouTube description section below. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Check out their Controller 69, which can help automate your environment's conditions. It'll automatically turn on and off equipment to help control the temperature, humidity, VPD, light schedule, and even the oscillating fans. Click the link in the description section below so you can learn more about the Controller 69 and the discount code MrGrow15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. Stash Blend is a 215 plant additive that can be used with synthetic bottled nutrients or in living soil systems. Simply mix half teaspoon of Stash Blend into a gallon of water, then water your plants with it. Ingredients include corn steep liquor, seaweed extract, humic acid, beneficial bacteria, silica, and mycorrhizal fungi. Check it out at stashblend.com, link in the description section below, and use the discount code the stash. Mars Hydro. Check out their new FCE 1500 LED grow light. You choose between Bridge Lux or Samsung Evo diodes, and you can add their iConnect smart controller to control dimming and scheduling in their mobile app. It's full spectrum, emits a uniform PPFD across the coverage area, and you can easily connect up to 30 lights in a daisy chain. Discount code MHFCE1500 works on their website, mars-hydro.com. I'll place a link in the description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today, I am joined with David Sandelman. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Chris? Good. Thanks for asking. So you are the inventor of the Canatrol. I'm actually using one of those. I've been using it for over a year now. And uh, we met at a conference. I filmed some footage with you explaining the, the Canatrol in, in detail, the cool cure, and Actually, one of my videos is dedicated showing mostly you explaining everything. It has over 100,000 views. Wow. So I know a lot of my audience is aware of you. They're familiar with you. And I'm really happy today to be able to sit down with you and really dig deeper into the Canatrol and really drying and curing in general. There's a lot of um, a lot of misinformation when it comes to that process, a lot of lack of information. I think we've learned a lot just in the past three to five years. So kind of uh, sitting down with you, catching us up to speed. Uh, I think is going to be real valuable for my audience. So appreciate you coming on today. Uh, before we get deep into the questions, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Well, um, my background is in designing uh, control systems. And, uh, you know, how I got into this world was uh, uh, solving a problem for cheesemakers, uh, aging cheese, which med- led to uh, charcuterie meat, which then led over to gardening and flowers and uh it, a lot was uh by accident uh i took a uh a wine cooler and why a wine cooler because it's an insulated box with a door no different i could have used a freezer i could have used a refrigerator uh, i could have used the yeti cooler but what i needed was an insulated box with a door so that was the simplest thing to start with and the size was about right for an insulated box with a door and then applied the technology for controlling the vapor pressure in the space, and then provided that uh, to a local uh, grower. Uh, he was a caregiver, and so he was uh, had lots of plants to grow, and I said, try this. And his first comments were, ah, it's not going to work. I only dry my flower when it's hanging, and there were shelves in it. I said, humor me. Just put the flower in there and try it. 
It may not come out as nice as you like. It's not hanging or what, but just try it. And he did. And about a week or two later, I went back to his shop and he said, I don't know what this is, but this is some of the best flour I've ever produced. I said, can I have the box back? He said, absolutely not. <laughs> and he used it for well over a year, one of the first prototypes. So wound up in it, you know, I'm going to say a lot by accident coming out of cheese and meat and saying, here's another product that you need to remove extra water. And what is this extra water? This water is unbound water. And unbound water is what molds and microbes feed and grow on. And if you eliminate that unbound water, so the only water left is bound water that they can't access, well, they starve to death. They can't grow. And you have a shelf-stable product. And so in the food industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, they use water activity as the unit of measure. They don't talk about percent moisture. They talk about water activity because that's the bound and unbound water. And they want to make sure that there's no, uh, not enough unbound water for microbes and mold to grow on. So now you have a shelf-stable product. And what you don't want to do in food, in pharmaceuticals, and in our world, is take out bound water. Because every molecule of bound water you remove from that is weight off the scale. And they sell their product by weight. It's a commodity. So you don't want to remove weight and just waste that weight. So that's why, you know, you want to use water activity, bound, unbound water as the units of measure. So a little bit circular description of how it got started, but that ties into where it all started with cheese and meat and applying the same uh, physics, uh, the same technology to a flower. Uh, that you want shelf stability and that you want a really good high quality product that you're not removing weight since you're selling it by weight. That's awesome. And what year was Canatrol established as a company and then the Cool Cure, which is the home grow dry box, what year was that invented? Uh, it's about four years ago that okay. I tinkered with the first prototype and we tested it. And we gave it to this uh, caregiver, and once he said, yeah, this really works, we went to a, a little uh, advocacy group uh, here in Vermont uh, where it was uh, home growers gathered and traded notes, and they would have competition for their home grow. And we brought a box there, put it on a six-foot folding table, and uh, I think we saw three or four of them right on the spot. And that's when we, my wife and I looked at each other and said, hmm, maybe we have something. So we went home and built a couple more. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, I've been using it for over a year, like I mentioned. And uh, I think it's a game changer. It has helped me out so much when it comes to drying. Just being hands off more, you know, not having to me mess with a humidifier, a fan, you know, within a grow tent. I'm able to actually harvest put it into the box, press the on button, and then go on vacation. It's happened to me twice now where I literally yep. had to harvest and went on vacation and came back several days later and it was good to go. So um, the convenience factor was a big thing for me. Yeah. Now on the cool cure, one thing you emphasize is dew point. Yes. You know, a lot of growers go by relative humidity, but you go by dew point. Can you explain the difference between the two and why there's an emphasis on dew point sure. versus relative humidity? Yeah, it, this is a common question. And relative humidity, the first word, relative, it's a relative value. And um, relative humidity is made up of two variables. And the two variables that make up relative humidity is the temperature of the air and the amount of moisture in the air. And if you change either of those variables, the relative humidity is going to change. So when people say, oh, I can control relative humidity. Well, in reality, you can't. It is not a controllable variable unto itself because it's made up of two, the temperature and the amount of water, which we call dew point in the air. An analogy I like to use is let's say you have a loan and you want to change your monthly payment. 
Well, there's no dial to turn up or down to change your monthly payment. You can change the interest rate, that'll change your monthly payment. You can change the principal amount of the loan, that'll change your monthly payment. You can change the term of the loan, that will change your monthly payment. But there's no individual thing that you can dial up and down that is the monthly payment. The monthly payment is the result of these other variables, be it the length of the loan, the principal of the loan, the interest of the loan. Relative humidity is the same. Relative humidity is the outcome of the temperature of the air and the amount of moisture in the air. Move either of those and you move the relative humidity. So what are we doing? We're controlling the two components that make up relative humidity. And so dew point is the amount of water and the temperature, dry bulb temperature is the amount of temperature. So now you can add or subtract the uh, temperature of air. That's easy, heat it, cool it. Or you can add or subtract moisture in the air. And by controlling those two variables, that's where you wind up with your resultant humidity. So at the end of the day, when you're drying and curing flour, the relative humidity is no longer important if you're able to control the two important variables. What's the air temperature around the flower and how much moisture or the vapor pressure around the flower? Now, once you hold the right vapor pressure, and we found that a 54 degree dew point, which relates to vapor pressure that's interchangeable numbers, the flower will dry to equilibrium. The vapor pressure of the flower will get reduced down to that vapor pressure of a 54 degree dew point. And now it's at equilibrium, the flower won't dry anymore. That's why you can go on vacation and you can even say, you know what, I'm not going home. I'm going to spend another week on vacation. And when you get home, the flower is not going to overdry because it came during your first week's vacation down to equilibrium to match that dew point. Well, you spend another week away. It's just going to hold there at that same dew point at equilibrium. What's happening now is you're increasing the cure on the flower. Now, other things are going on, the ripening into trichomes and things like that, but it's not going to overdry. So that also eliminates before you would put the flower in a space with an air conditioner or a dehumidifier. And what are they designed to do? Remove water constantly remove water. When you buy a dehumidifier, it's rated in pints per day. And it will do that forever until it turns your flour into crispy little bits. So that's why at some point we would dry, then cure. Because we had to arrest the drying process because the room with the air conditioners and dehumidifiers would just keep sucking water out of it. And then move it to a sealed container to arrest that drying where in a cool cure, it's at the finished place. So it stores there and holds. Understood. And that's where it really comes into the vapor troll technology is my next question. But what I do want to mention, which kind of reminds me of dew point versus relative humidity is similar to like EC versus PPM, where electrical conductivity is kind of that, that absolute value. Uh, and then PPM is just a calculation of the EC. Yes. So that kind of reminds me of, you know, dew point EC and then RH being the PPM. Uh, it's kind of simpler. People kind of similar in the sense to where people are still using PPM, but EC is a little bit more accurate in that avenue. It's, it's the primary unit of measure. Yeah. Right. That's dew point is a primary unit of measure where relative humidity is a calculated value on the dew point and the temperature combined. That's what the, the equation works out to be. Got it. Now, getting into the vapor troll technology. Now, this is uh, something that uh, you've created. I, I believe it's a, a trademark uh, patent, I believe. You can correct me if I'm on there. What exactly is the vapor troll technology? So what we've been able to do is control the vapor pressure in the, in the space as a controllable variable, um, which is the dew point. So when I say vapor pressure, I'm talking dew point. If I'm saying dew point, I'm talking vapor pressure. Um, there's a, an equation where you put E is at one side vapor pressure, and then 
and all these other radicals and brackets and stuff like that, or the T's, which are the uh, dew point temperature. So you can flip the equation either way. So you, we can use that interchangeably. Um, up until now, um, air conditioning systems, uh, dehumidifiers have what's called a sensible to latent ratio. Okay, so when you start cooling air, once you cool it below the dew point condensation forms and you start drying the air because that water comes out as droplets on the fins on the evaporator coil and drops out and you're removing water from the air. But those units have this sensible latent ratio, which is pretty well fixed. So it says, let's say you have a 70-30 kind of split. It means 70% of the energy goes to cooling the air and 30% of the energy goes to drying the air. What our patents are about is we have split that so we can independently control the dry bulb temperature, which is the sensible capacity of a heating or cooling system, and the latent capacity, the amount of moisture we can remove from the air. So by doing that, we can zero in and get you the dry bulb temperature and the dew point temperature that you need to get to the perfect conditions for drying, curing, and storing. And so far we have uh, two patents issued and we have a third one back and forth normal course of dealing with the United States Patent Office and a fourth application about to go in with the patent office. Uh, the uh, European Patent Office has already approved this and we're at patents in several European and foreign countries as well. Oh, that's pretty cool. And yeah, on the cool cure, you can have different settings, right? Uh, I think a lot of people are think that it's fixed on the default settings, but you can actually change that. Um, first of all, what is your recommended or, or default dry and cure settings that you have on the cool cure? So we ship the units. There are thousands of them out there and proven over and over again. A 68 degree dry bulb temperature and a 53 to 54 degree dew point is the best settings. Um, if you lower the dry bulb temperature, it takes longer to dry the material. And it's a longer period that you potentially have unbound water where you have the possibility of microbes and mold to grow. So at the settings we have, we get to a target water activity in about four days. And then we recommend four additional days of cure uh, so things can ripen and get better. Now, there's a lot of discussion about 6060. Now, first of all, we get a lot of people, they get our unit, and they go, oh, I'm going to set it to 6060. Well, the two readings on the unit, the first is the dry bulb temperature, so they set that at 60. But then they set the dew point to 60. Well, when the temperature is 60 and the dew point is 60, you are at 100% relative humidity. You are at saturation. You've created fog. That is the perfect conditions to take everything you put in the unit and turn it into one moldy, gooey mess. So you can't confuse 60% uh, relative humidity with a 60 degree dew point. Now, we've looked into trying to find the origins of where did this 6060 come from? Well, we do know that a 60% relative humidity will equate back through a bunch of equations to a 0.6 water activity. So there's some, some science behind that. But the 60 degree temperature, what we can surmise is when people started putting it in rooms with air conditioners, if you brought it into your bedroom and you hung the flower up and the thermostat was set at 68 degrees and the compressor ran for a couple of minutes every, you know, couple of times an hour, well, it wasn't running long enough to dry the air because it's only taking moisture out of the air when the compressor is running. So how do we solve the problem? They would turn down the thermostat to force the compressor to run as much as possible so it was actively removing moisture from the air. Well, if you look at most uh, mini splits with wireless remotes 
or air conditioning thermostats, they only go down to 60 degrees. So, is there science behind the 60 degrees? Or is the 60 degrees because that's what most thermostats will only go down to, which was it was set to, to force the compressor to run to constantly remove moisture from the air. We haven't really gotten to the source of where that came from, but pretty much everything we've come up with leads to, that's the limit of home thermostats where you were hanging your flower to try and dry it. That's interesting. Yeah, anybody who I really have talked to over the years have told me, hey, 60-60, that's the best way to dry it. Even the commercial facilities implement that, and they're using the 60-60. But is that really the best way, or is that kind of like a bro science technique where there's really no studies to back it up? That debate still goes on today, for sure. It's, it, it was the best that was available. So what did we do? We worked with um, the Research Coalition, and they ran flour at 6060, and they also ran flour, well, that's 60 degrees temperature and 60% relative humidity, and ran it side by side with a cool cure that was set at the factory defaults of 68 degree dry bulb and a 54 degree dew point. And they've now put out a white paper, and the terpenes were 16% higher coming out of the cool cure with a 68 degree dry bulb and a 54 degree dew point as compared to the room that was at 6060 Legacy Conventional. So the data is out and there is a white paper out now that goes through all of the sciencey stuff that the PhD people did for these tests. Typically you hear about the higher the temperature, the more terpene loss there is. As the terpenes volatize at the higher temperature. Do you think the reason for, I haven't seen the white paper, do you think the, the, the overall result, one of the reasons why uh, it, it resulted in that is the consistency in the conditions uh, and it being inconsistent with the 60-60 method, kind of up and down swings with, with temperature and humidity? Yes. We, we are currently undergoing now research into what might be happening. And one of the things, and we, it is yet to be proven and demonstrated, but this is the path we're going down, is that with conventional equipment, uh, every time the refrigeration compressor cycles on and off, whether it's with an air conditioner or whether it's with a dehumidifier, when that liquid refrigerant is injected into the evaporator coil in that piece of equipment, um, the temperatures are down in the uh, mid-20 degree Fahrenheit to low 30s. And then when the compressor turns back off, well, that coil is no longer cold. So the dew point and the vapor pressure rises. So every time the compressor cycles on and off, the vapor pressure dew point is cycling up and down, up and down. Now think of the tops of your trichomes, these nice little bulbs. And inside these bulbs are all the terpenes and all the good stuff. So what we're imagining is happening, and this is what we're doing with the uh, you know, electron microscopes and, uh, uh, you know, digital microscopes is to see if the cycling is causing these bulbs on top to expand and contract, expand and contract and expand and contract and eventually weaken and fail. And now you're losing your terpenes once they fail. And what we're hearing about is shelf stability. If by us holding a constant vapor pressure, that those trichome heads are able to ripen and become more sturdy and more durable. And so that way, not until you grind and smoke that flower, do you now release those goodies, those terpenes that are in those trichome heads. Yeah, the fact that these swings could potentially be causing a rupture of trichomes and, exactly. and a loss of terpenes is just, it's a little bit mind-blowing to think that that would actually be happening and the stability, how important it really is. And we didn't really know about that five years ago. You know, now we do know about it. So, or have the technology cool. to maintain stability. True. Very true. But taking a step back, one thing I did want to just touch upon is we get lots of people asking, can the cool care be set to 60 60? And yes, it can be. You just have to adjust the dew point. I don't have it memorized, but 
there is a, a setting for 60 degrees Fahrenheit and then the dew point can be set so you can achieve that 60% humidity. So if you're a tinker like me, like I've tried it with the 6060, I've tried uh, 6360, I've tried 6560, I've tried 6860. So I've messed around with it quite a bit and really don't notice too much of a difference, to be honest with you. Uh huh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you're getting into the nuances. And, and with every unit is shipped uh, an instruction manual, and in the back of the manual is a chart. And you can look up for any given relative humidity, temperature, what the dew point is. So on that chart, you would look up the 60 degree dry bulb. You would look across the chart to find the 60% relative humidity, and then it will tell you what the dew point setting is. And you're definitely then causing the machine to work harder because it's having to run at lower temperatures. And it's not a refrigerator. There's no compressor. So it's, you know, it's not designed to be cooling to those, you know, it can, but, you know, its sweet spot is where they run. Understood. And so the default settings on the cool cure equals a dry length to be four days. Some people may say that's a little bit too fast. Others say that's perfectly fine. That's probably the, the fastest you want to dry at. What length of dry is too fast? And what are the downsides for a fast dry? Okay, so let's start with what's the definition of dry? And what have people been using as a unit of measure for dry? They typically were probably looking at stem snapping, which is a pretty arbitrary thing, or moisture content. And when you're looking at moisture content, well, that's not representative of uh, bound and unbound water, which is expressed by way of water activity. So when we say the flower is dry, we're talking about achieving a water activity of 0.6, which means it's now shelf stable, that you've removed all the unbound water. Now, at that point, is someone going to consider it dry? Uh, we like to see four more days of cure on it, uh, even though the water activity is no longer going to change. So, but what can happen is if you dry something too quickly, and this is doable, if you put that flower in a very low uh, dew point space, very low vapor pressure space, you can do what's called case hardening. And this also applies to the food industry, that the outer water leaves very quickly and that causes a case hardening and you trap water inside. The inside water can't get out because you've sort of created a casing on the outside. Um, and that happens in charcuterie. If you're drying a salami, and you dry the casing on the outside too quickly, the moisture in the center of that meat can't get out anymore. You've case hardened it. And what you will wind up with is rancid meat because your water activity in the center is still too high and microbes and all kinds of other nasties can breed in there because there's still free available water. So the mechanics probably apply perfectly well to uh, a flower that you remove the water out of too fast. Got it. And I know just from uh, the, you know smoking perception, it's, it can become very harsh. It's a fast dry. Uh, I've noticed a hay smell on a lot of things that I've dried real fast, and it's just been very harsh and not pleasant when consuming. Now, on the other end of things, when talking about the length of dry being too slow, how many days would you say is kind of too slow of a dry? And what are the downsides of having a slow dry? Okay. So back to water activity. The longer you have free available water in that flower, the longer that flower is exposed to the possibility of mold and growth going on in there. So you don't want it sitting around with free available water for an extended length of time. It's going to go moldy. Yeah, that's why we like hitting that water activity, you know, in about four days. As far as number of days, though, I've heard as low as, well, as maximum is 10. You shouldn't go any more than 10 days through drying, at least bringing that water activity down to the 0. 0.6. Is 
Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Is 10 days or longer too long? I personally would not want it any longer than it needs to be because any day longer is another day you are ex you are exposed to the possibility of mold and bacterial growth. You know, back to what our, you know, objective is, is to get to a shelf stable product. And, you know, at four days, you're pretty, you know, you're good. Now, can you get the water activity down to a 0.6 in one day? Uh, I've not tried it. You probably wind up case hardening it and not be able to get unbound water out from the center. So we're typically seeing by day four, your water activity at 0.6, but then another four days of cure. And there might be during those additional four days, some additional equalization of water activity throughout the structure. Now, at the end of eight days, you have really high quality smokable flour, not harsh, smooth, but you can then leave it there 30 days. Uh, last night we pulled uh, golden goat out of uh, a cool cure that's been in there a month short of a year and it's still sticky. That's incredible. Now you mentioned water activity. You've touched upon it several times now. I have a lot of folks here that are tuning in that this is the first time they're ever hearing of water activity. You know, the might be more in the beginner stage or whatever. For whatever reason, this is the first time they're actually hearing about water activity. You mentioned 0.6. Is 0.6 the target? Can we get a little deeper into water activity? You know, what is it? What's the actual target? Why is 0.6 the target? So on and so forth. Okay. So there's been all kinds of research. Uh, water activity is a unit of measure that's been used for decades uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, by the food industry. They only deal in water activity. Um, what we are speculating is if uh, there's rescheduling from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 um, and the FDA gets involved, FDA talks water activity. And everyone's got to learn water activity because that's the unit of measure they look at for shelf stability and products. You know, that that's a unit of measure. Um, so with decades of research and stuff at 0.6 the microbes and mold that grow that will be harmful can no longer survive in an, uh, an object of something that has a 0.6 water activity even museums that have rare documents measure water activity and they want to make sure those documents that are 0.6 or lower because they don't want mold and microbes to eat up those rare documents and open up a box and there's dust in there. So they too are interested in water activity. Here's where food industry uses water activity. If you ever get those little cracker cheese sandwiches, now cheese you would think is wet and a cracker is dry. So why, after you open that package, after it's been in there for months, aren't those crackers mushy? Because they make sure that the cheese and the crackers are at the same water activity when they're manufactured and put together. So now, with the same water activity, there's no water that can transfer from the cheese to the cracker or vice versa. We're not talking percent moisture. We're talking water activity, which is sort of a unit of measure. And that's why those crackers don't get soggy from the cheese. Because you'd normally say, cheese is wet, cracker is dry. But it's all about the science of water activity. There's all kinds of uh, research and Wikipedia and stuff that talks about water activity. So we're taking a technology that's been used for decades with all kinds of research and understanding and now just applying it to, to something different but physics stills apply and there are these charts and diagrams that show water activity at 0 0.9 0 0.8 0 0.7 0 0.6 0 0.5 and through the different values they show which microbials can flourish you know where the cutoff line is and what they find is once you get to 0 0.6, you're in a happy, safe place. Really, the number is 0 0.65. 
is where all of the the nasties you don't want to grow fall off once you get down to a 0.65 there's no longer that water to free available water to feed them so we like to say 0.6 so we got that little half a point in there from 0.6 to point you know 0.65 down to 0.6 to make sure we're in the the happy zone and then correct me if i'm wrong if i'm drying in my cool cure and it goes through that four-day dry cycle on the default settings, it's safe to assume at that point that the product inside is at the 0.6 water activity at that point. Is that right? Correct. That's what we find. And that's, that's at the default settings we set it at. We've not done extensive research at the 6060 number uh, because, well, we, you know, we've tested it where the factory settings are and where people have the most success. So, Will you get to a 0.6 water activity with a 6060 equivalent value? That I don't know. It might be a, it might be a day or two longer. I do believe that the lower the temperature, the slower it is to dry. So it might push you into that five day, six days. But without testing it, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And then you touch upon vapor pressure several times so far, and that's another thing that I feel like a lot of my viewers are going to hear VPD, and they're going to be like, wait a minute, the plant's not growing anymore. Correct. Like VPD is a, doesn't really matter, right? Correct. It's like uh, you know, using VPD while the plant is growing, it, it controls the stomata opening. Now when the plant is drying, there's no real stomata for it to open. It doesn't really affect, affect in that avenue. No, you're right. VPD applies to a living plant. Why? Because the plant is actively putting water out through the stomata. And you're going to that, if you know what your leaf surface temperature is, you can calculate the saturated vapor pressure of the leaf. And now you have a vapor pressure at the leaf. And then you want to set up the vapor pressure in the room. And you want to set up a difference between the two so that the water leaving the leaf can freely flow into the room and not hang out underneath the leaf where you're going to get microbial growth, mold, things like that. So you are basically maintaining a vapor pressure difference between the leaf and the room. And almost think about a pump maintains a pressure difference between in and out. You're sort of creating this difference, so there's this constant flow of the water vapor from the leaf into the room, and you don't want it to fluctuate. You want a constant flow. Now, let's take that leaf, the, uh, that the leaf, the flower that you just cut off. It's dead now. It's got a finite amount of water. There's no more roots connected to it to bring up water. So it's it's got an absolute amount of water it's starting with, and so it has a vapor pressure. And now you're going to put it in a space like a cool cure, which has a lower vapor pressure. And the vapor pressure is set based on the 54 degree dew point, And that flower has a higher vapor pressure. There is a difference. But we're not going to talk about vapor pressure deficit. What's going to happen is that flower is just going to start losing water because it's at a higher vapor pressure. But it's now going to consistently go lower and lower and lower until it comes to equilibrium with the space. You've dried it. So vapor pressure deficit is a proper term for a flower room, live plants, water constantly coming out. Would you talk about vapor pressure deficit when you take a knife and put it through the sidewall of a tire? Well, there's a vapor pressure difference when the tire is full. And then after you pull the knife out when the tire is flat, they've now equalized. The vapor pressure in the tire is the same as outside the tire. It's a flat tire. That's at equilibrium. And when you, before you cut the hole in the tire, there was a difference. But you really don't talk about that. It's just that the tire's at 30 PSI, <laughs> and now the tire's at zero. Uh, same thing with the flower. The flower had a high vapor pressure, and now it's dry. It's at equilibrium to the space. So is there an ideal vapor pressure for drying or is uh, curing storage? Yes. The 54 degree dew point. Got it. If you know 54 degree dew point, you can calculate vapor pressure. It's a linear, it's, it's a one for one. 
there's a straight equation. You put in dew point and it gives you vapor pressure. You put in vapor pressure and it gives you dew point. So what is the flower starting at? It's a live flower. I don't know. It depends probably on the cultivar, the size of the flower. You know, all of those can vary how much water is in that flower when it's freshly picked. But all we do know is it's wet. And we're going to put it in an environment like a cool cure where the vapor pressure is known. And then that flower is going to lose its excess water until it comes to equilibrium with the space. And at that point, it's going to be at a 0.6 water activity. It's not going to have any unbound water. It's at shelf stability. And you got happy life. <laughs> that makes sense. So after the drying comes curing. Now, this is uh, another debated topic here of as far as length of cure. How long does flour need to cure for? Okay. It, so we find you like to have a minimum of four days. So like eight, eight days from when you put a flour into a cool cure, eight days later, you're smoking some pretty amazing flour. But we, what we have learned and experienced firsthand is that different cultivars age differently cure differently so now you can think about wines and how some wines the day they make it it's drinkable and if you let it sit for two years or 20 years it's not going to get any better if anything it's going to get worse where there are other wines that when they're freshly made aren't so good to drink and you got to let it lay for 20 years to mature and then it gets better so we had that same firsthand experience. We grew a jelly bean and an Acapulco Gold side by side, harvested them both, put them in a cool cure. At eight days, the jelly bean, as always, a favorite, it was great. We tried the Acapulco Gold. It was harsh. It was nasty. It was like, this is disgusting. We're a bit of snobs. Let's throw it away. No, no, let's leave it in the box. 30 days later, that Acapulco became the new favorite. So what we learned is that that particular cultivar does better with a longer period of cure time as compared to, let's say, a jelly bean. And we've got some commercial facilities who said, you know, we've you know, come back with them and said, I really would prefer now what I know to have a different dry cure room for each one of my cultivars because I can see the difference and having one room, I got to compromise to come up with the best for all. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, cultivar specific, uh, you know, you hear about that, but you explaining the difference between just those those two cultivars is like, it's pretty pretty mind-blowing, you know, that it can be such a big difference between the two. And, and, and what's happened now is you have an environment that's repeatable and consistent. So up until now, without having that consistent, repeatable environment, uh, there were too many random things that would affect the drying phase, then the curing phase. And at what point did you arrest the drying and put it into a jar or and then burping? What time of year did you open that jar to burp it in the middle of the winter when it's bone dry? Or did you open it to burp it in the middle of the summer when it's soaking wet outside? All of those would affect the outcome. So you really couldn't tell what your outcome was caused by and all of these other random, uncontrollable environmental conditions. Now you have the ability to put a flower and it doesn't matter what time of year it is. It doesn't matter where you are in the high desert or down on Flo in Florida or on the coast. Um, you're going to have the same results in the box repeatedly over and over again. That's awesome. Now let's flip it up. Let's talk about a wine fridge versus a can of troll. So uh, I've gotten comments on videos, particularly the ones talking about the cool cure. And uh -huh. I did a review video and I did a video kind of just talking about the unit. And um, a lot of people had said, oh, I'll just buy a wine fridge and dry in there. Uh -huh. Can you talk about the differences between, <laughs> you know, trying to dry in a wine fridge versus a can of troll? So the reality is uh, we need a, uh, a sealed box, an insulated box with a door. And 
we can buy these boxes, insulated boxes with doors that were originally designed to be a wine fridge. But that's all we're getting is the insulated box with the door. There's nothing else about it other than its visual look or size that makes it a wine fridge. It isn't. It's an insulated box with a door. Then we put all our technology into it. And it's some pretty advanced patented technology. It's not like you can put some beers in there and keep them cold. It's not what it, it's, no, it's an insulated box with a door. We don't have cooling systems in there per se that you would put in a fridge. It doesn't exist. And what helps us, because these things are expensive to build, and we're building them here in the U.S., and we take really good care of, you know, our staff, and they're, you know, well taken care of, it gets expensive. So one of the places we are able to help control the cost is to buy an insulated box with a door that is made by the millions for another application. And so we're able to uh, get, you know, help reduce that cost of materials by repurposing what is starting out to be an insulated box with a door that otherwise could be destined to be a wine cooler. So what would happen if somebody tried to dry in, in just a wine fridge? They'll mess up because there's no vapor pressure control. There's no control other than temperature. So don't waste your money. Just use your regular household refrigerator. Uh, it gets too dry. Because moisture is kind of being removed in that sense, right? Correct. Yep. There's, there's so no control. fast dry. There's no, dry. no control of vapor pressure. So what will happen is it'll keep continue drying, drying, drying. And like any other system, you're now going to be back to a two-step process where, okay, is it dry? Is it dry enough? Or I got to address the drying, take it out, and then go put it in sealed containers. And if I took it out too soon and there's still free available water when I put it in that sealed container, I need to burp that sealed container or I'm going to get stuff moldy or if i took it out and it was too late and now i put it in that sealed container and then i open that sealed container repeatedly in a very dry climate i'm just continuing to over dry that flower so no a wine cooler won't do it nor will a dehydrator do it a couple people have mentioned in the comment section like oh just take a sponge just like the canatrol has and i'll put that in the wine fridge for drying so that'll right. help adjust the humidity. And, well, back to adjusting humidity. We, we covered that topic. And then where, where did they dial in the vapor pressure or dew point, which is what's really controlling the drying? All they can control is the temperature. So wine fridge, no bueno for drying. <laughs> Got it. Now, how about for just curing and storage? Let's say that they store in jars, okay, mason jars, uh -huh. and the jar is sealed and they have humidity controls. Maybe they have one of those humidity packets in the jar. So that's controlled. And they put that in the wine fridge just for curing and storage. Is that an acceptable thing to do or would you advise against that? Well, if they already have a cool cure, there's no reason to do any of that because they're taking their flower out of a controlled environment that's going to maintain it at the exact precise vapor pressure for long-term curing and storing and then going to put it into a jar and screw the lid on it we don't know exactly what the environment is in the jar now we can add uh desiccant packs into that jar which are now trying to uh, control the vapor pressure in that jar where they already took it out of a box where they had it under perfect control, but now they're trying to do it another way. Um, it's a lot of extra steps, and I'm not really sure what the objective is, where in a cool cure, we now offer hemp bags, where you take your finished flour, you put it in a hemp bag, and you just leave it in there on the shelf. And it's great. You mark the hemp bag with a Sharpie, what the cultivar was, what the harvest date, and over a period of time, you have a whole library in there. You open the door. Let's see. What are we going to smoke today? <laughs> we want some of this, you know, kush, one of this blueberry, some, you know. I've been using the brown paper bags because I think you guys were using that before. 
Yep. The uh, the hemp bags. And I was using those ones. I'll have to pick bags. up some hemp yeah. bags. <laughs> now, let's say they don't have a can of troll and they just want to store in the wine fridge. Oh, if they then yeah, then they're looking to if they've got the flower to some target water activity and not moisture content, and they put it in a jar. And the conditions of the air, you know, when they close the jar are about where it should be. Um, and they put some desiccant pack to help stabilize it. Yeah, then putting it in a wine cooler is maintaining a stable temperature. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, it, you know, it brings up an interesting point. You know, you talk, we go back to the 6060. And if you talk to the wine world, a oh, wine likes to be stored at 55 degrees. Well, has anyone sat down with a glass of wine and asked the wine what its optimum temperature, where is it happy to be? And the reality is, four, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, they've been drinking wine a long time. And they found that if you keep it in caves, that's where you can store it. And what's unique about a cave? It's got a stable temperature. And... The mean temperature underground is 55 degrees. So, was 55 designed for the wine? Or did the wine happen to be in stable temperature caves that happen to be at 55? Maybe that wine's happy at 58. Or maybe that wine's happy at 52. We know for sure if you put it at 90, it's not going to be so good. But is there magic about the 55 or is the magic about keeping the temperature stable where you store it? So now back to, yes, keep that flower in stable temperature conditions. At a minimum, if you don't have control of the vapor pressure of the flower at the same time. Got it. There's a couple other devices that are often compared to the Canatrol. Humidor. Uh -huh. What if somebody dried in a humidor? Is that uh, sufficient drying advice, uh, drying system? It, the humidors don't have active vapor pressure control. Okay. Basically, they're holding some temperature, and then they're typically controlled with uh, a desiccant pack of some sort. Okay. And then another one is the egg incubator. Could you dry in that? What do eggs like to incubate underneath the chicken? They like nice, warm temperatures. And what do nice, warm temperatures do to your flour? They boil off your terpenes. So we spoke about, you know, the 60-60 versus we use 68. You're still below the temperature where terpenes tend to volatize. Once you get into the high 70s, low 80s, that's when they all really start rocking and rolling and boiling off. And, uh, yeah, incubators, they're nice, warm, cozy places. <laughs> you wouldn't want to dry in there either. That got it. an incubator right. would be no different than like a food dehydrator. Okay. I got a product specific question from a viewer. Uh, this viewer had mentioned that they were advised to dry in a grow tent for one day, then put it into the cool cure. Yes. Is that ideal or can people just put it straight from harvest, straight from cutting the plant down into the cool cure? It, so it depends. Um, it depends on how much uh, plant matter you have, um, you know, and uh, there is a limit to how much uh, a cool cure can take. Um, so if you are in a rather dry environment and you can take your plant and hang it for a day or so, you're going to lose a good chunk of water during that period, which will give you the ability to put more into the cool cure to start with. Um, not much different than soaking wet towels going into your clothes dryer. You can wring them out before you throw them into the clothes dryer. It'll help the clothes dryer. But if you don't have a whole lot to throw in your clothes dryer, just toss them in. It's going to dry anyway. So it's more of a technique in order to kind of fit more product within the cool cure. To maximize it. That's right. Yeah. Yep. But if it's not a, if it's not an issue, uh, some people, uh, you know, you get into that harvest period, want to turn it over pretty quickly. So... That buys them some time by doing it for a day outside before they're utilizing the unit for bringing more flour in. Uh, if you're not in those time constraints or volume constraints, 
No, just throw it in there. You don't need to do it. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I've just been harvesting and then cutting the individual branches up, taking off the larger fan leaves, uh -huh. and yep. then putting into the actual cool cure, and that's been working out great for me. Yeah, the larger so. fan, all the fan leaves, all they do is adding uh, water to remove that has no value. I also have heard strange things like, oh, should I turn the plant upside down to hang? And like the, and they were saying, it was almost as if the sap was going to flow through the stems and wind up in the trichomes. No. <laughs> There's <laughs> nothing running down the stems into the trichomes. I've heard so many different things. Some of the comments I get on YouTube is just so far-fetched. One comment I remember vaguely is somebody had mentioned that the trichomes should rupture during the drying or curing process for a more oozy and sticky result. <laughs> <laughs> just like, I didn't know if it was just a troll, like just trying to troll and get people to like, I don't know, have a bad dry or, or if they've actually thought that. Uh, there's some crazy ideas out there. Yeah. So the final product coming from the cool cure, right? So you've dried it for four days. You've got the four days worth of curing, eight days, and you can keep it in there for really several months, years. Yeah, you've right. kept it in there and it's been a great product. How do you describe the final product? Okay, it's uh, fluffy, not fluffy in a light way, more uh, spongy uh, and sticky um, when you grind it. And we found now, instead of a grinder that shreds, we're using these things called flour mills, and the consistency is amazing. It's easy to roll. It like sort of has the spongy and it just lays out nicely, smooth. There's no hacking. You know, it's rare if ever someone who smokes from flour that comes out that's properly dried and cured has that hard hacking cough. It's just got lots of flavor, taste. It's like you can really experience um, all the nuances of the flavors and smells that are, you know, in the description of what that cultivar is. And, well, you experience it yourself. Yeah, when I remove flour from there, you know, the initial smell isn't too, anything too crazy, but then when you put it in the grinder, it really, you know, like you mentioned, being being locked in there and then unlocked kind of as you put it through the grinder, it definitely releases a lot of, uh, a lot of loud smell. <laughs> that, those are the terpenes that are locked in the trichomes. And we do get complaints that the flower doesn't have as much smell when it comes out. And it's like, that's right, because all the terpenes are still sealed in there. Break it open or grind it. And typically the response we get is, oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest uh, misconceptions is like when somebody's just has their flower in a bag, for example, and they open up like, Whoa. Whoa, this stuff stinks. This is this is fantastic. It's like, is it great that you're smelling all that right this second? Because it's all volatized and it's now in the air. It's not right. in the flower. So, yep. <laughs> yes, it is nice and in in uh, it is nice to get that smell, but realize that there's actually a loss happening into the air. We we experienced it at big commercial. We'll go to a big commercial grow, and when you're half a block away and you smell it, you go, I think a problem's there. <laughs> so how does the final product compare to freeze-dried? It's completely different. Um, as far as the texture, you know, uh, freeze-dry, you just turns to dust in your fingers when you try and when you're trying to roll with it. Um, powder versus something that's got some nice springy texture, sticky texture to it. Um, as far as the smoke, um, it, I find freeze-dried to be harsh. Um, compared to, you know, something that's dried and cured with the cool cure. That's my personal preference. Um, and if you are looking at weight, um, when you freeze dry, you're getting rid of all the water, all your weight. So if you're in, in the business, um, it's not a good bottom line. I agree. Yeah, I think there's a big difference between the two. I actually got my hands on some freeze-dried freeze product last week and uh, for the first time. And it's great in bowls and bongs, but when you're rolling it and, you know, in a joint or a blunt, it's like 
not anywhere good as just stuff that's been in the, the can of shoal, for example, or or dried in a grow tent. Um, big, big difference there. So when people say that is freeze drying is the future, uh, I can't agree with that because I, I feel like it's not good for all methods of consumption. There, there are great applications for it. I don't believe smokable flour is one of them. And one thing it reminds me I wanted to touch upon is the actual final product you mentioned before, but I forgot to mention it, is when you mentioned fluffy, I just want to clarify that it's not airy. Like the buds aren't always airy. Uh, I know a lot of folks go after density. Right. And the density is, is definitely still maintained. So I just yep. want to clarify that in case anybody anybody uh, took that the wrong way. I think the fluffy has to do when you squeeze it, mm. it springs back a little bit versus crumbling. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, the freeze dried stuff just just crumbles right up. Big difference. So, talking about the future of the cool cure, are there any new features coming out in the future for that? At at this time, no. Um, you know, since a lot of it is basic physics, um, you know, we're just working on basic physics. So, this, you know, technically, there's not a whole lot we can do there. Um, and as far as Things in the future, we're always pondering it, but nothing at this time, you know, to uh, to talk about. Okay, and then I gotta ask because it is one of the biggest complaints: the price uh-huh. is. Uh, many claim that the price is too high. Will there be a price drop at any point in the future? Uh, there's none that we anticipate. You know, we've cut out what we can. Part, you know, we discussed early. We're buying an insulated box with a door that was destined to be a wine cooler to get the price as low as possible for that component. Um, and then the rest of it is the electronics. Um, and then it's built all here in Vermont, in the United States. We have an amazing staff. Uh, they get paid vacations. They got a 401k. They got health insurance. Um, and they cost money to treat people well. And that's what we believe in. And, you know, yeah. Could we go and uh, have this whole thing made in China? Uh, people who are, you know, barely scraping by for labor, that's not what we believe in. Understood. Yeah, a lot of people do want to support American manufacturing, American assembly, and you know, buy America. And sometimes that does result in the price being a little bit higher. Yep. But uh, you're paying for the workforce, you know, you're really employing people. So, yeah, there, there's a bigger picture there. Yep. And that's that we're firm believers in it. That we would just just listed as one of the best uh, businesses, companies to work for in the state of Vermont. Wow, ah, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, let's wrap things up. We covered quite a bit here. Can you tell the listeners how they can find you? And is there anything upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Uh, no, any information, we are at canatrolls.com. Uh, we've got an Instagram page, um, good social media following, and... Uh, well, Chris is a great resource. He has one. He can tell you all about it. But yeah, definitely. Any questions, you can even pick up the phone and call us at our phone number, uh, 802-738-0709, or go to the website. There's lots of resources, information, case studies. Uh, there's nothing here we're hiding. Awesome. And to make things easy for the folks tuning in on YouTube, I'll definitely have a link to the website down in the description section below. And also have as a pinned comment as well for easy reference so you can easily click over to that website and and check out the products. Well, David, thank you so much for coming on. I think there's a lot of valuable input here that's going to help out the audience. So really appreciate you coming on and spending the time here to sit down and and talk shop. And maybe we can get you on in the future and do a part two. If anybody has questions on the product or just drying and curing in general, leave it down in the comment section below. If there is enough questions Maybe we can get David on for a part two and just go through a kind of Q&A on, uh, on drying and curing. Oh, love to. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Cool. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thanks, everyone. Peace out. Catch you in the next episode.